Afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us in, uh, in this series of webinars. Today's our second one, um, and we're going to look at an introduction to support and resistance with Clive Lambert from Futures Tech, very well respected member of the uh, technical analysis uh, community. I shall pass you over to Clive. Thanks very much, Chris, and thank you to everybody for attending today. And yes, okay, so hopefully. Um, you uh, you uh, listened in last week. If you didn't, then um, then then no problem. You're more than welcome to be here. We're looking at support and resistance today, uh, which is the basic building blocks, if you like, of uh, technical analysis. And um, you know we're going to keep it pretty pretty simple for today. Although I think last week someone was asking me about gaps, uh, which are price gaps, which can uh, give you support and resistance. So I've thrown a couple of slides on the end of today's presentation to look at that. And then hopefully towards the end, uh, if we've got time, uh, which we should have, um, then we can look at some live market charts and we can answer any questions that anybody has. Um, so yes, support and resistance is quite simply uh, the idea that prices move up and down and that is all about supply and demand. It's about the number of buyers versus the number of sellers. And the market is purely an auction process, if you like. It is like going to an auction house and the more demand there is, or the less supply for something that there is, i.e. so something is rare and people want it, then it will go for a higher price. Um, and prices move down in uh, stock markets and other markets, forex markets, uh, because there is more supply than demand. There are more sellers than buyers, and we need to lower the price needs to lower in order to find buyers and attract buyers. And when buyers that on a market that's moving down are found or uh, attracted, if you like, uh, that is the moment at which the balance between supply and demand and the dynamics of that change. Um, can you hear me? Sorry, Chris is saying that my audio is gone. So let's just try and sort this out. Uh, testing, one, two. Hello. It's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Chris, can you tell me if you can hear me, please? Okay, right. Yeah, that seems, well, we're back. that seems to be fine now, Okay, excellent. And we've got somebody else saying they can hear me too. So I'm just going to carry on, and apologies for that small glitch, if you like. Um, okay, so yes, supports the name given to a price at which markets bottom out and buyers start to outweigh the sellers. Uh, and the sellers were obviously uh, dominant up until that point. So it's almost like a scales, you know, scales being tipped from uh, dominant sellers to uh, the buyers starting to uh, dominate things. Okay, so and resistance. And so there's, there's an example. Right there is a market finding support and the uh, balance tipping back in favour of the buyers and the market starts to push higher again. Uh, if we see a market that's travelling higher and then tops out and starts to travel lower, that is where the sellers turn things around and they start to outweigh the previously dominant buyers. Pretty simple, we're looking at highs and lows on our chart. And Last week at the end of our, the talk, we talked about the three principles, the three basic tenets or principles of technical analysis, that everything is in the price, that market action is repetitive, and the price is moving trends and trends persist. So let's think about those in terms of support and resistance. Markets, uh, sorry, it's actually the bottom two that we're actually going to highlight on, actually. We know everything's in the price, so it's the buyers and sellers that are setting the price. Uh, market action is repetitive. Old support and resistance levels are remembered and referenced and can often repeat. Markets have very long memories, uh, secondly. Now, the other thing about that is that uh, the markets do have long memories and it is always, um, yeah, the, the, that's, that's what creates support and resistance levels because people remember or you know, traders remember um, where the, the previous battlegrounds were because that's where, they, uh, where things changed for them, if you like, uh, if they're long or short. Um, and obviously these days we've got uh, lots of uh, technology 
that can, uh, you know, charting systems uh, to jog our memories if they're dimming somewhat. You know, I actually consider that my job as a technical analyst is just to remind people of uh, turning points from bygone times, if you like. And if something is trading at levels like, um, well, like Brent crude oil at the moment, it's trading at levels not seen since uh, 2015. And so I consider that, you know, part of uh, an important part of my job for my clients is to tell tell them what um, you know what the big levels were back then because we're back there now and uh, they they could come into play again um, as we you know as we're back at those levels and um, we'll go into further details to why as we go along um, so you know so prices moving trends and trends persist and I think we uh, very briefly introduced the idea last week of the definition of an uptrend, the definition of a downtrend. We're going to go through that now, uh, but if you've got old highs and lows defining the trend, then they become important reference points, and they become the support and resistance levels that you need, to, that you should know about if you're trading the markets. Where are the support and resistance levels that could come into play for any particular market? So yes, an uptrend, an uptrend as defined by our man Charles Dow, that we talked, who we talked about last week. You know, one half of Dow Jones. Um, an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows. So each one of those red flashes on that uh, graphic we've got up there is a pre is a resistance level being broken, and you quite often see a reaction when resistance levels get broken. The blue arrows are support levels hold, you know, support levels being created, and so we've got these higher highs and higher lows, which give us support and resistance levels at every step of the way, if you like. As long as the highs are getting higher and the lows are getting higher, you can say that we are in an established uptrend, and all the time that's happening, you can say there's nothing to, um, there's, there's no reason to, uh, to, 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 to one to bat against that trade, that trend. And uh, two, to um, get out of any long trades that you may have. Now, obviously, this happens over different time frames, and we have different time frames to our trading, so that's an important consideration when we're looking at this. But you know, the general principle is, you know, and a, uh, and a half decent general principle to um, to, to live and die by is that. Um, you know, as a trader, is to is to be long of stuff that's in an uptrend, and um, be out of stuff or going short of things that are in a downtrend. So yeah, what we've got on our screen is an uptrend, higher highs and higher lows. What have we got on there now? Yeah, and this is the basic building blocks. I don't, I'm not going to apologise for um, sort of uh, going through this step by step. What we've got right there is an uptrend still. We have a market that is still uh, making higher highs and higher lows at that, at that particular time. How about now? I've added an extra, you know, an extra step to there, and at this point, we have made a lower high. Okay, right here. But until we break this support level. We can't say we're in a downtrend uh, because a downtrend is obviously the opposite and is a series of lower highs and lower lows. Um, we can't say we're in a downtrend until, bang, that happens. We break the support level, having made a lower high, and then this, you know, this is the point at which we can say now this chart has changed and we are now in a downtrend. We are making lower highs and lower lows. And you know, I think that this is this is pretty important stuff when you're considering markets like equities at the moment where the market just almost feels like it's going up in a straight line. Um, and there seems to be a lot of um, people out there who are um, getting worried about the um, you know these advances uh, and thinking that uh, we might see some sort of a correction stroke crash stroke something nasty around the corner um, and whilst I agree with those sentiments actually personally yes the chart is not suggesting that the chart is still in this mode here okay the chart is still on an uptrend it's still saying to us this market's going up don't go against it so, and this is an important thing, and this is kind of what I'm trying to get 
you know, it's, it's one of the things I mentioned last week about technicals versus fundamentals, if you like. Whatever you think is going on or should be going on or, you know, is going on but you don't understand why it's going on and you think it should, you think it should be something else, it doesn't matter because the chart saying to you, we're going up, end of story. And it's only when the chart does that that you can say, okay, something's changed. And so, and then as the as as markets correct or pull back, you can quite often, if you look back up to the left hand side of your chart to wherever we were the last time we were trading at these levels. So, so you get to you know the market's falling down here, and you're looking here, and you're saying, well, let's go all the way back to here. And here is and some old levels that were in play the last time we were at these prices, and that's a useful exercise. And i and then hopefully I'll uh, you know illustrate that as we go through today. So yes, we've got the definition of a downtrend. We've got the definition of an uptrend. That we've got to the idea of support and resistance uh, nailed down. Um, what creates a trend? What makes markets move up and down? It's very simple, and it's all about that. Everything is in the price thing. It is people. It is the it's the sum of all parts of a market, buying and selling, and setting the price with their buying and selling. Um, but it's the collective mass of operators in the markets, and this is where things can get tricky because you can't make you know you can't make generalizations as a technical analyst is in an attempt to sort of um, personalize things to make it in to make my job interesting interesting for people or, or my work interesting for people to listen to I do talk about the bulls and the bears okay I talk about the market is being bossed by the bulls at the moment the bears are, are, are licking their wounds that kind of thing and all these kind of um, you know phraseology that you can use but basically the whole the, the, the reason for it is because you're, you, 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 well, it's just, it's storytelling and it's trying to make things interesting. I do uh, feel quite strongly that um, what I do, technical analysis, can be very boring. So I do try my best to make it a bit interesting. <laughs> I don't know whether I succeed. You can tell me. Right. And there are lots of different market operators operating in the same space, if you like, all the way from short-term traders right up to long-term traders. And I've kind of got a non non-inclusive list there. You've got scalpers and day traders. You've got swing traders and position traders. Uh, prop traders at, uh, at, at, at you know that are trading their own money are down at this end. Prop traders that are trading for the banks are more towards the middle, although there's not so many of them around as there used to be. Hedge fund managers uh, are, you know, are, are, are um, you know, they, they've got a, um, a bigger say in the markets and are longer term. Uh, if you're looking at agricultural markets or things like, uh, you know, the, the, the commodity markets, then end users are very important. Um, we have, uh, you know, in uh, my my client base on the, on things like oil markets are the oil companies, you know, that actually are looking, you know, they, they, they're hedging the markets the whole time. They're using the futures to hedge uh, the markets and so their, tra their hedge trades will and can move the markets. Pension fund managers and sovereign wealth funds and central banks are obviously right at that long, longer term end of the scale. People who are, you know, that that are have a strong vested interest in the markets. That's not an exhaustive list, and there's lots of different traders from different categories who might be in different places on that on that uh, scale if you like uh, we you might have some head you might have hedge funds that, that do high frequency trading so they'd be, be more towards the left hand side it's a, it's a reasonably uh, it's, it's, it's a reasonable rule of thumb to say that the shorter term a trader is the more reliance they generally had on technical analysis although that is changing I do have colleagues who work for you know who, who I speak to who work for um, um, the, the large banks and institutions who spend a lot of time talking to central banks about charts um, so yeah that's a that that's an interesting thing and I think it's something that's changed over the last few years so um, yeah worth worth pointing that out um, 
So let's have a look at some support and resistance in action, if you like. Uh, and I've got a um, a 20-year chart for the FTSE 100 index uh, right there, and I've drawn two, I've drawn three lines on that chart. That's all I've drawn on there. Uh, there's a line which was the 2,000 high, which was 6,950, and I've just drawn a horizontal line there. And when, in 2007, just before the banking crisis, we got close to that, and then we fell over again. To, we got to, to 2013 to get back there, and we failed again. It, uh, then 2015, we tried again, came all the way back to 5,500. Uh, but what we've seen actually through 2017, and maybe I should have updated this chart because we're up to here now, we're sort of trading for the FTSE 100 around the 7,500 mark. So we've actually finally, on this particular market, seen off that resistance at 6,950 to 7,000 that had been weighing for a very, very long time. And interestingly, both of the lows on that chart are around that you know, 3,250, 3,450 area. So again, we've got a clear, just all I'm doing here is drawing horizontal lines on a chart. And it's amazing how simple and effective that in itself can be. And pretty much all we're going to talk about today is horizontal lines on a chart. And I think that um, you know, some sometimes there's a um, there's a propensity to overcomplicate charting, to overcomplicate technical analysis, to look try and look at too many things, when actually something quite simple like a horizontal line on a chart can just be so effective and so useful for you. Um, last year's big question was, can the Dow get through 20,000? And it took a while. And um, these big round number levels, these psychological resistance levels, can uh, be interesting and can, um, can can be important and can um, cause trouble, if you like. And um, so I actually did a bit of a study myself last year of the Dow, uh, going back, you know, 40, 50 years to say, well. You know what? How did it? How does it get on? Uh, what you know? How how has it got on with psychological levels in the past? And the interesting bit for me was this sort of 1960s and 70s, right into the sort of mid 80s bit here. That line there is 1,000 on the Dow, and we just kept nudging up to it, nudging up to it, nudging up to it, and fell over. When we eventually broke above it, we never looked back. And then you start to look at 3,000. That was the, that took a little bit of a you know took a bit of time, took a few years to clear. 4,000, we hit resistance and came back. 5,000, we didn't even touch the sides. 10,000 didn't act as a uh, as a resistance level. We went through it. We got up to 11 and a half, 12 there, and then all the way back to um, to 7,000, something like that. And there's fourteen. There's there's fifteen thousand. Is that is this uh, this line here? And again, we didn't spend long above there, and we just kept going. We came back and held it, and then we got to twenty thousand. And again, uh, haven't updated that chart from um, the, from from when I actually um, when when I uh, previously uh, looked at it. But I can tell you, yes, that the Dow now is you know is 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 still flying on as we know, I'm sure, um, and is is you know as we speak trading what it's uh, trading at 23, 23 and a half thousand now and making new all time highs by the day and not allowing any of these um, these these psychological levels uh, to get in the way if you like so let's just get that out of the way what's that doing there let's have a look right so that's uh, maybe hopefully an interesting uh, take on on the round number resistances. I think I mentioned last week um, a few books that I would suggest reading, and I think one of them was called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator by Edwin Lefer. Um and that's got almost an entire chapter devoted to the idea of round number resistance, you know, which is interesting. How about the role of other traders and people who are looking at the markets from a very different point of view within all of this? And um, my uh, fundamental analysts or fundamental traders, uh, what's their role? Could stocks get bought? 
and that buying will see resistance levels broken. Analysts upgrade and downgrade things and send out research notes. That can move prices through support or resistance levels. Uh, you have you know, value plays that can equal support on uh, stocks and on particular markets. Um, and again, you know, I think it's interesting that if you look at fundamental analysts and the, as a community as a whole, if you like, um, that they do very much heard they do they 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 they, they do all you know, often say the same thing at the same time. Uh, the cynic in me would say that they're always um, you know, something. I think oil is a good example. I think I saw somebody tweeting today. You know that all the same people that were saying oil was going to go to twenty-five dollars six months ago are now saying it's going to seventy-five dollars. So, um, but uh, I've got to say that wasn't me. Uh, you know, I um, uh, uh, yeah, I was uh, I've been pretty bullish of oil for a long time now, and it uh, hasn't let me down. Algo trading is is a is a hot topic, I guess. You know, algorithm trading and uh, how these uh, these robots are uh, running the markets. And I think I may have, you know, I think we're going to get onto this in 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 later weeks. The idea, you know, I think. Algo algorithm trading often gets blamed for stuff that maybe it shouldn't be getting blamed for, if you like, because actually, even though it does a big percentage of uh, trading in the markets, it is very, very. It's usually very small uh, increments that it's uh, that it's that, it, that it's trading, and it's not really often. Depends on the algo, but most of these algorithmic uh, trading models are not going to be moving uh, markets. But if they do, they're, they're trading and they're triggered triggered by events, uh, events that can break support or resistance levels. Um, another thing that algorithmic trading um, does, the models that I've seen, uh, they can be triggered by an uptick in volume or the release of a number, and those events can usually provide you with a break or a hold of a support resistance level. Um, you know, and they seem to go hand in hand quite nicely. Uh, but you know, and, and I think it's worth remembering the last point on that slide is that algorithmic trading models ultimately are written by human beings. <laughs> so even though it's a computer doing the trades, it's a human that's inputting the criteria for the trade and he's coming up with the how that computer is going to uh, trade the markets. So the idea that um, you know we're being taken over by robots, um, yeah, yeah, you know, I think um, as far as the trading sphere is concerned, these are robots that are designed to do human stuff quicker than humans, but it's still human stuff. Does that make sense? Am I just talking rubbish? I don't know. Let's go on to the next slide. <laughs> Um, as far as talking about support and resistance levels are concerned, I think you know, the levels that were the scene of the battle, if you like, a few days earlier, will still be fresh in the market's memories. But um, I, you know, I do subscribe to the idea that, um, however old a level is, we should be aware of it at the very least. So there we have a 30-minute chart where the market is, uh, you know, is is sort of bouncing between fairly clearly defined support and resistance levels and again all I've done here is put some put three horizontal lines on a chart and you know the market has used those reference points um, over the course of that chart um, and that's obviously on a 30 minute chart so that is our short term example but again we can use the FTSE to say a longer term example is this uh, was this Big resistance around 68.50 to 69.50 that was just capping all these moves the whole time, and um, you know, at the, over the course of um, of, of this uh, millennium so far, if you like, even going back as far as 1999. Uh, one of my favourite moments uh, of um, and, and it was around the time that I was quite often going on CNBC, which is something I haven't been doing for a few years. But um, one of my uh, one of my favourite moments with respect to sport and resistance and my uh, you know the work I do was was when gold was rallying back in two thousand and six seven and um, and when we got um, and. Once we once we got through 500, everyone was getting excited about a thousand, and I said, "Well, I'm worried about 729 and 875." And people laughed at me and said, "Excuse me, 
I went, well, have you looked at the chart? And they go, well, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. and I'd say, well, look, I'm looking back to 1980 when we had a spike in gold. And um, 729 and 875 were important, so I'm not even worrying, I'm not even thinking about $1,000 yet because those levels are on my chart going back that far. And I had people arguing with me and saying to me, you're an idiot, what do you know? If your inflation adjusts gold back 15, 20 years, then um, then then those mat those those levels become two thousand dollars or two and a half thousand dollars, and whatever whatever you're saying is is rubbish, and you can't da 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 da. And so I was getting quite a lot of stick, which is why it's one of my favourite moments because when we got to 7.29, right here in uh, 2006, seven, uh, the market fell over. The market fell over all the way back to uh, near to five hundred dollars from seven hundred and twenty-nine, and it was almost to the dollar that we got that move. And so, just in one, you know, that was that was a, a classic sort of it's a bit of history, and it's an example, if you like, of 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 how you know looking back. Because I get the same thing actually with the FTSE. People say to me, "Well, the constituents of the FTSE 100 are very different now to what they were in 1999," and I totally agree. Um, and it is a it is a bit of a head scratch. So how come seven thousand was continually a um, an important mark for this? And I think it's to do with psychology, and I think it's to do with sentiment, and it's to do with trend. And it just goes to show that however much you rationalise things, uh, sentiment and human behaviour is still what may be one of the most important drivers in the market. And if we're saying that, then something that can gauge sentiment and human behaviour is surely one of the most useful things that you can use. And that, for me, my friends, of course, <laughs> is technical analysis, is charts, and is looking back as far as you need to go to say what happened last time we were here. So that is my, you know, there's another little, you get the, you'll get the occasional mini rant from me if you like and there's one of them uh, and obviously as well, you know, I, I, I try and, I like my slides to sort of try and give you some historical context at times as well. Uh, now something some people say to me is, well technical analysis is self-fulfilling then, you know, surely if everyone's looking at these things then it's going to happen. Um, and yeah, okay, right, you know. That is an argument, but I'd say that um, that you know, I'd, I'd counter that uh, by saying that yeah, you know, and a lot of people said because we've all got charts now compared to you know 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago when not everyone had charts. Um, so now more than more than at any time, um, our access to charts means that technical analysis and price behaviour can be self-fulfilling. And again, I, I just don't agree with that because most of the principles uh, that we use in technical analysis are from 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, it's not to say we haven't advanced our techniques, but I'm saying that the basic principles are, are still from then and they still hold true and are, are you know, the, the, yeah, the reason why they're still the basic building blocks is because they still work. Um, I'm just a, a believer that the market's too big for any one way of looking at the market to dominate. Um, and I also think the technical analysis, um, saying that, te that if, you know, technical, it's the technical analysis that um, is self-fulfilling is a little bit disingenuous because technical analysis in itself is a fairly wide church, and and whenever you know at any time in the markets, you you you're never going to get all the technical analysts agreeing with each other. Although I think we do agree with each other more than most, and and I'd like to think that that's always in uh you know in with respect in the right way round as opposed to what I was saying about the fundamental guys earlier who seem to get it the wrong way round. <laughs> um, now. One of the things that um, we've seen of late in equity markets that I think someone was asking me about last week was um, price gaps, and um, you know, and, and so I thought, yeah, let's put that's that's a, uh, a methodology for looking at um, uh, support and resistance. So let's uh, talk about price gaps, and let's um, you know, so if, and if we were to go to the textbooks on uh, on gaps. 
then we would be met with a sort of a, a labeling of particular gaps depending on where they are in the trend uh, and you know, the textbooks say there are three types of gap if you like there are breakaway gaps there's measuring gaps and there's exhaustion gaps uh, that fourth one, island formations, we can get onto a little bit later. They're very rare. Now, here is a, a price chart. Here's a chart with that one down there would be classed as a breakaway gap. The market has been trending lower, making lower highs and lower lows. We then start to rally and we gap higher there and that signals the end of the uh, you know that almost is an early signal of the end of the selling and a sudden uh, return of the um, of the buyers and uh, we didn't look back at that for a while the middle one of those three measuring gaps I don't actually I don't like personally and I never really seen much evidence of these around them of them working um, the idea behind that is that you get price gaps in the middle of a trend and that if you know where the middle is then you can sort of um, get you know, glean a target for where the end of the trend is, if you like. Uh, as I say, um, I've always found that personally a little bit uh, difficult to um, to get my head around, and to um, and I haven't spotted any real many real life examples over the years that uh, encourage me to um, to pursue that particular idea. We are going to look next week at um, chart patterns, and we're going to look at. Um, sort of things like um, pennants and wedges and, and that kind of thing and there again they've got a similar kind of measuring um, idea attached to them and I think that's got a bit more merit but anyway I, um, let's let's get back to our gaps because one of the things that you do you know, the, the idea of exhaustion gaps the third type of gap is that when a market is getting towards um, a high or getting towards highs, you see gaps at that point. Uh, the market, because highs are created by euphoria, if you like, generally, and euphoria can quite often manifest itself with markets that are opening, you know dramatically higher you know, day by day if you like because everyone's just piling in and just can't you know we can't miss this we've got to get involved we need to be involved um, so I often if I see a market that is making new all-time highs and is uh, there's gaps appearing on the chart then that is one of the things that can that that's, that that starts to set off warning bells in my head um, that the rise that you're seeing may be um, getting a little bit uh, over, overdone and may be due at the very least a correction uh, if not you know, a top might be in place um, now most because most gaps a lot of gaps get filled on the day okay uh, and it's all about the psychology if you like of the market on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and 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 how yeah, you know, and 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 what happens because if you think about the market gapping higher during an uptrend, okay. So what we're saying is that we are opening above yesterday's high. If you're bullish, if you are a somebody who is invested in the market and is you know is try, is 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 buying the market because you think it's going to continue to go up, then arguably you're going to want to keep the market above that uh, previous day's high. That pre the previous day's high in a rising market, uh, if we open above that previous day's high, then that instantly becomes a support level. And the bulls, the buyers, want to keep the market above there. The bears, the sellers, will be keen to push us back into um, the previous day's range, and day traders will uh, will get involved and tr and trade these gap levels. Uh, and the way they'll generally do, you know, the way a, a, a common day trade, if you like, uh, involving a gap, say we're talking about in a rising market, is you buy you, you buy in the gap. With a stop below, you know, in, in with a stop below the bottom of the gap, i.e., your stop is back in the previous day's range. So if the market gaps higher and stays above the gap support, then you're long and you're staying long. Um, and that's a you know, a fairly 
fairly common uh, trade that uh, I see people doing. Um, if we're trending lower and we gap lower, then people are looking at, so, so we're opening below the previous day's low and we're in a falling market, then people are looking to sell a rally to the gap resistance uh, and if the market doesn't retake that gap resistance then you've got a good you know you've got a short on in a, a good place and you can um, you know and, and 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 but so it's a trade that's got a night yeah it's, it's got clear parameters it's got clear parameters of uh, where you're going to enter and where's you where's a nice tight stop on it if you like yeah and here's an example of one such sort of idea, okay? Now here is a 30 minute chart and this is one day here, make it lower highs and lower lows and this is the lower the day on that day. We open lower the next day and we took all uh, we took all day to rally only back to the gap and then we fell over again and then we carried on going lower and then that was the low on this day here and we opened below that the next day. We got up to it on that bar there and didn't like it, but it was on this bar here that we retook the gap and that prompted a rally. And so this is the point, this is the sort of thing I'm talking about, okay? If you know if you had a short there, then you would make money. If you had a short there you would get stopped out, but you could get stopped out for a for a quick for a small amount of money. Uh, I think the DAX gapped higher this morning. Um, and interestingly as we talk we're back Below, we're back into yesterday's range. So there is a a small sign, if you like, of uh, of weakness there in equity markets, which we haven't seen a lot of lately. Um, but the um, you know, that's an interesting thing that uh, has has been seen in the DAX for me this morning is that uh, yesterday's high. I'm looking at the futures was. Uh, 13.480, and we opened um, we opened this morning at um, 13.507, instantly traded up to um, 13.533, uh, but now have sold off back through 480 and are currently trading at 450. So that is uh, an example of a market that hasn't held the gap, and there might be some more bearish implications on that basis um, because of that. What else have I got left here? Now, if you're trading and you're going to be trading using support and resistance, then the idea is that, you know, and if we're with just what we've looked at today, okay, all you're doing is drawing horizontal lines on the chart. You're drawing horizontal lines, old highs, old lows, um, maybe, and, and things like gaps and that kind of thing. And the idea is, for me, is uh, with respect to yeah, the way I try to trade, is to look for where you've got a lot of reasons to, um, to, to buy something, if you like. Let's just say buy something. Uh, there's lots of support levels below the market. Uh, there's not much resistance above the market. Um, and there, you know, so, so if you have your, so, so your stop is, is better protected. Your stop is well protected, if you like, compared to and whereas your targets should be easily achievable. That's the sort of golden egg, if you like, with respect to trading using support and resistance. And it's very difficult to 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 really, you know. So that's that's almost like I'm giving you a taster, if you like, of how we get, where we want to try and end up with this um, after you know on week ten, if you like, because there's not just. Yeah, not just horizontal lines. Uh, there's, there's there's plenty of other ways of spotting support resistance. You can look for trend lines. You can look for channels, chart patterns. Uh, they're going to be covered in uh, later weeks. We're going to look at Fibonacci retracements and extensions, and again, they can provide support or resistance levels. We're going to look at Bollinger Bands and moving averages. Again, things that can provide you with support or resistance and can be can be skewed to your time frame and the charts you're looking at. Uh, we're going to look at Ichimoku cloud charts. Uh, I think that might be um, you know, a lot later on during the uh, 10 weeks. And market profile, another subject that's quite dear to me, that can provide support and resistance levels. So it's only really once we've got all of these things in place that we can find the two or three that we can put together, or three or four that we can put together to say, 
look that actually with that with that with that provide us with a framework that says this is an important support level this is an important resistance level it's when things come together that I get really interested things from different methodologies so thanks for listening today hopefully I've given you something to think about more than happy to answer any questions that people may have or more than happy now uh, as we you know as we're finishing up to look at any um, to look at any markets that uh, anybody may be interested in looking at and um, yep yeah, so you know thank you very much um, I have got a question that's come in already actually will markets always close a gap um, now that I think I kind of covered that a little bit during the talk. Most markets will fill a gap um, within a very short period of, you know, within four to five days. I've heard that stat, and I can often see that happening. Um, uh, but there are gaps that will be left for a very, very long time, and um, you know, and, and 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 and. But in general, yeah, most gaps will be filled. Um, I think there was an interesting one in um, Bund futures a few years back. Uh, on the upside, and everyone was saying we're never going to see that again, and we did. It took, it took two or three years to fill the gap, but we did get there in the end. Um, with respect to um, to gaps on on, you know, one thing I will say about gaps as well, which is something that is a little bit difficult uh, to unless you um, uh, yeah unless you've got a very sort of uh, high end charting system. I'm going to show you a chart here. This is the Dow futures and this is on my um, my charting system you won't find this on um, you, you won't find this on, on on most charting systems especially the ones uh, that you get with uh, with your platforms and that kind of things um, but this is because what I've done with this chart is strip out uh, what's happened overnight this is just what's happening in the day session and this is the Dow and so this is the Dow, and each one of these candles on here is just giving us what happened between, in UK terms, 2.30 in the afternoon and 9 o'clock at night. And so we're actually, this is the day session, the bit that's going on while, uh, yeah, the, 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 the futures trade that's occurring whilst the cash markets are open. And so this gives us the gaps, and we can see that in the last month or so, we've left one, two, three four, five, six price gaps. Um, and in, you know, these brown ones here are actually these, the, this one and this one and this one and this one are the times where we left a gap but then we went back to fill it and you can see here that worked out to be quite a good support level. The only one that didn't really work was this one. This one uh, was filled the next day and then we rallied that one was filled the next day and then we continued to rally and so these are the times these are the times where they worked particularly well on the day if you like or or soon after there's one that didn't work at all that worked soon after these have just been left and we're starting to see more and more of these which is something that says to me be what you know be afraid if you like um, can I look at the DAX as a live example of support and resistance Yes, uh, we can indeed. Um, but again, I think you know the things we're the things I'd like to look at more than anything. We probably need to uh, add a few more uh, methodologies onto onto our charts in, uh, before we can get too excited. Uh, before we can before we can really make an analysis that some that, that, that everybody can understand. This is the DAX. This has been uh, this is in a channel. Uh, we have had gaps here. Look at that one there. The high on that day was 13.163.5. The low the next day was 13.165. Uh, the high that day was 13.249.5, and we've gapped higher there. Uh, we are fine. Yeah, we are creeping higher and just posting these small body candles here. Um, and we're getting close to this channel resistance, which is where we failed at today. Another thing that I use uh, as support though and to say is a market still bullish or bearish is uh, something called Marabuza lines and again we'll cover those in later 
seminar, uh, later talks, but that at the moment, I'm looking at the deck futures here for DAX, and that's saying one uh, 13,394 is a strong support, and what I'm saying to my clients is all the time we're above that pink line there, uh, we've really got nothing to worry about, and we should not be getting too um, concerned, and we can still continue to look to buy dips. Uh, the DAX, the gap thing that happened today, um, is you know there it, it, it that there is just is high actually no sorry there uh, and we dipped through there and then rallied here but since we've broken back below there it hasn't been that clean to be if I'm honest with you on uh, that particular on this particular occasion uh, but we are below. Now we didn't hold the gap, and that is what's prompted further weakness since then. Um, do I find floor pivot levels effective as support and resistance? I do not. <laughs> Quite simply, no. Um, interestingly, I know people that do. Um, so, and I'm just going to show you a quick example of one of my. Uh, one of my reports, is it going to come up on the right screen? Uh, yes, it is. This is what I send out to my clients each day. And I have support and resistance levels here. And I have my charts here and some commentary here. See this PP, S1, S2, S3, and then I've got R1, R2, R3. They are the pivot points. And so I, whilst I personally don't like pivot points and don't find them particularly useful, um, I do uh, put them on my reports in, so that traders can use them as part of their process, if you like, and they can compare the pivot points here with uh, my analysis that I've got down here. And that, in you know, there we go. Already, I've been proved wrong because R1 pivot point, which is bait, which is calculated using yesterday's data, is 23,536. Uh, and that is also a level that I've got myself uh, as a as a resistance level to watch uh, from my own analysis. So that may increase, if you like, um, that um, you know the 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 the, um, the the significance of that particular level. And that's again the sort of thing I'm talking about where you can combine, if you like, uh, two different uh, methodologies. Um, what else was I? I think I had something here that I was going to show you. Um, here's here's an interesting chart. This is gold, okay? And this is 1264 in gold. It was the low there on the uh, in 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 what was it? The sixth of sixth October. It was the low at the end of October. It's been the low a couple of times in the last few days. We're, and it's also a Fibonacci level. We're going to talk about Fibonacci in later week, weeks, 61.8%. And we keep holding this. And that's prompting me to think bullish thoughts in gold, if you like. OK. Uh, questions are still coming in. Um, right, we've got that one. We've got that one. Which time frame do you use? for the chart when you want to act as a day trader and trade following the actual trend. Um, day trader, again, it, it, this is one of those questions that are a little bit sort of how long is a piece of string and difficult to answer. Um, a day trader, so you're, say, you're saying that you want to do what, half a dozen trades a day maybe across uh, two or three different markets and you want to be out by the end of the day. Uh, if that's the case, um, then you're looking probably, and it's not which time frame, it's which time frames, because I think it's important to look at more than one time frame on your charts. Um, and so I would consider that your time frames for day trading, uh, useful time frames would be 15 minutes and, and, and 30 minutes. Uh, if you are, and um, you know, so there is the gold chart. There is the uh, 15 minute gold chart, and uh, we have something called a vacuum support here at 12.75. I wonder if I can just throw some lines on here quickly to show. Yeah, let's just put some horizontal lines on the chart. There was a breakout point from yesterday, and that is a support level. We have got close to that overnight. Uh, we've got another one. Do I have to press this each time? I think I probably do. 
Um, with, yeah, but there is another horizontal level uh, where it was support, 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 and then broke down. So 1278 is a level to watch. Um, we've got something going on around here at 1281. I've uh, got some upper shadows there. Um, seeing some upside rejection late on yesterday. Where's the change over the days? It's around here. Okay, so you know, for me right now, 1275 looks like an important uh, support level, and if we can hold that and then retake 1278, then we can look back to 1280, and then look back to yesterday's high there at 1281. And because that's our 15-minute chart, we can maybe go to the hourly or 30 minutes. So day trading, yes, 15-minute, 30-minute hourly. Use two of them. Okay, use two of them and see if they are see see if they're giving you different messages or the same messages. Why does this thing? I tell you what, that's annoying. Okay, um, and but actually, gold's not a particularly great example at the moment. It's been rather messy and going and been chopping sideways, and we're not getting. You know, we look at the hourly there, and we're not getting a lot of clarity. Um, so we are better off going. You know, then we would need to move either higher or lower in our time frames to see if we can get some more clarity on different time frame charts and and again I would say to I would suggest to you that um, that you look at two or three or four different markets uh, you try and learn their particular um, the, the, the way they trade and um, and you and, and 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 so if one market's misbehaving, if you like, you say no, that's not the the charts aren't clean and clear and crisp. They're not giving me um anything you know that I that across the two different time frames that I can really hang my hat on. So I need to look at something else. I need to look at another market. I need to disregard that for the day, or I need to say. It, you know, find the support or resistance levels that need to break up or be tested in order for you to be interested in that market again. If we actually look at gold on that hourly time frame, you know, if go back to that, that's a great example, I think, of a of a messy looking chart that says to you, leave it alone and find something to trade that actually makes a bit more sense. Okay? Uh, but as I say, by uh, whatever, what I would say, here's one thing I would say about day trading. Um, if you're day trading and you're saying, what's your time frame, and I've just suggested 15 minute, 30 minute hourly charts might be useful, you should still be looking at the daily and the weekly charts every day at least once because they're the ones that give you the context of, from which you are going to try and uh, basis your entire trading day. Context is so important, and the bigger picture charts give you that context. And quite often, you know, like that hourly chart there for gold that we've got on the screen doesn't give us a lot and tells us we've got a mucky market. But it's only when we go to the daily and actually the monthly chart on gold that we say 1264 is really big support, really important support. So actually, despite the hourly looking a bit mucky, we want to be trying to buy dips. Is the RSI important to me? I don't use indicators a huge amount of the time. Indicators are something that we will be getting onto in later uh, webinars, and so maybe uh, the best time to discuss them is then, because I can give you, you know, my complete uh, overview, if you like, of what I'm, th where, how I use them, and what I would use them for. And uh, so just to answer, try and give you some sort of answer to your question, sir, uh, or madam, um, they can be useful for confirmation purposes, and I will always look for divergence plays. Uh, but again, that's something that might not make much sense to people, but hopefully we will do by the end of our 10 weeks. So I think, unless we've got any other um, questions, I might just call it a day there and say, um, Say thank you very much, and we will. Um, you know, um, I'll pass you back to Chris. Thank Hi, you Clay, very much. Thank for you listening. very much. All right, cheers, Chris.
Thanks, Clive. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming and attending the uh, webinar. We'll, of course, be here uh, at the same time next week to do part two of Support and Resistance. In the meantime, if, you, if you've got any questions regarding the, uh, the, the charts on the platform and how to add indicators or anything about the products and services that we offer, you can always come to our website and just come via the live help function here, or you can, of course, use a chat function um, through your platform. Again, you can telephone us uh, on the numbers below here or email the uh, general number and one of us get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your time and we will see you again next week.